Kicking off the list at number 10, we have Fuse, aka Johnny Watts. Making his debut in Hawkeye Volume 5, Issue 2 in 2017, we find Johnny crossing paths with Kate. We find Kate taking out some frat boys and she actually almost shoots Johnny. But he insists that he hangs around to make sure that she's okay. He's not a bad guy, he's not a threat. He's actually quite amazing. Everyone be like Johnny. It's not hard. Watch out for people. And then he returns in the next issue after finding Kate, but this time we see him insist that he goes along for the ride. Interesting. He got close to Kate during investigations and eventually Kate ends up having feelings for Johnny. In an amazing reveal, we find out Johnny's true purpose. So during a battle with Hawkeye and Madame Mask's crew, Johnny saves Kate's life by shielding her from falling concrete. Super strength, super speed, no, no, no. See, Johnny can omnimorph duplicates. So basically, he can essentially become any substance that he makes contact with, hence the fitting alter ego super name, Fuse. Johnny Watts is awesome. He's laid back, realistic, charming, of course. I'm kind of hoping we get a version of him in the Disney Plus Hawkeye series. He could be a nice mid-season surprise. I don't know. I'm here for it. And before we continue with our list, guys, if you haven't already, please make sure you go ahead and toss us a thumbs up on our video. It's this one, not this one. Unless you're Spider-Man, then it's that one. But still, you know, it goes a long way here at our secret base. You guys rock. Thank you so much, nerds. Back to some heroes. Let's go. Coming in at number nine, we have... Mosaic. First appearing in Uncanny Inhumans number 11, Morris Sackett played pro basketball for the New York Stride, a five-time championship winner. He has latent inhuman heritage in his DNA, which becomes activated by a Terrigen bomb, transforming him into an inhuman through Terrigenesis. Seriously, he doesn't even have a physical body now. Mosaic now exists as an unknown form of energy floating around with the incredible ability to possess people and gain access to all of their memories, skills, and abilities. He can also phase through solid objects, levitate, and become invisible. He's actually picked up a whole lot of other abilities since he burst onto the scene because he keeps the abilities he learns when he possesses someone. He's got this interesting duality about him as a character in that he's got all these cool abilities, but now it's like he doesn't even exist. I really love how Marvel is playing around with the concept of identity with this character because that's something that we're all thinking about. Who are you? Furthermore, who are you if you have no physical body? And coming in at number 8, Clayton Cortez. Also known as Weapon H, Clayton made his debut in Totally Awesome Hulk issue 22. And he's exactly what you would guess. He's like Wolverine but with far more discipline and control. Clayton was a marine and former Eagle Star contractor and he was actually hired a part-time to take out the villagers of Yujanka for sabotaging a Roxxon pipeline. So Clayton had a change of heart and then went ahead and killed his own men, which then led to his capture and sale to Dr. Alba. Dr. Alba is great at her job. I mean, that job, of course, being the creation of Wolverine-Hulk monster hybrids. It didn't take long for the Hulk and other mutants to storm in and investigate Weapon X and, of course, raid their central command. So Weapon H ended up retaining memories so when he was sent out to fight H-Beta, there's like heads getting cut off. It's a really wild time, but Weapon H remembers getting tortured, so he wants revenge on the Weapon X staff. Nice. Luckily, the Hulk holds him back while they get away, or it would have been pretty, pretty messy, to say the least. Number seven, Ironheart. Ironheart's big debut was Invincible Iron Man Volume 3 in 2016. Riri Williams built her own Iron Man suit and is a gifted young scientist enrolled at MIT at age 15. A genius inventor, even at the age of 10, she reverse engineers the tech from Iron Man armor model number 41 and gets all inspired, going on to create her own prototype suit from stolen materials found on campus. When her actions raise a suspicion of campus security, she just throws on her suit and flies away. She winds up stopping some escaped prisoners and catching Tony Stark's attention, and he totally endorses her dream of becoming a superhero. During Civil War II, Tony Stark was knocked out by Captain Marvel, and Riri steps up to continue his legacy. She's been busy since her debut, joining up with the champions to fight Hydra, and eventually being offered her own lab at MIT. Some fun facts about Ironheart? The name Iron Woman was apparently too old fashioned and Iron Maiden, as you can imagine, was already taken. And she's a big fan of Tribe Called Quest. And number six, Snowguard. Making her first appearance in Champions Volume 2, she's a teenager from Canada. Yeah, from a village on Baffin Island in Nunavut. So Amka countered the Inuit spirit Sila 
in containment while she was investigating the master of the world's faculty. So in Northern Lights Part 1, it really pulls you in right off the bat. It feels a lot like Star Wars in a way, like when Rey was climbing around Starkiller base, Amka tries to free Sila, but of course, she was attacked by the base's drones. So she ended up pushing them into a containment field, which caused an explosion that freed Sila. The explosion didn't end up injuring Amka. Her brave actions were a great call. The spirit actually healed her instantly. So Amka was trapped in the faculty, but she was now one with Sila's powers. Those powers being divine empowerment. So because of her actions saving Sila, she can now harness the spiritual energies of the Aurora Borealis and the Arctic. That's not too shabby, and that's also not all. She can also transform herself into animals, like more than one animal as well. She can make herself turn into like a group of animals. Private petting zoo for the win. And of course she can fly, because, you know, why not? Number five, Singularity. Singularity first appeared in A-Force number one in 2015, the all-female team of Avengers. Her origin is still a mystery for the most part. She first appears as a meteorite flying across the sky and crashing down near Arcadia on Battleworld. Nico Minoru, he comes along and he brings her to the rest of the A-Force where she inexplicably opens a portal, like, like she's kind of like half conscious when this happens, and the portal opens and a giant hostile sentinel pops out. Later, in an epic display of power, Singularity absorbs an entire army of undead, swooping up into the sky and exploding in a flash of light to save her new friends. She next appears in the Marvel Prime Universe in Avengers Volume 6. When she appears, the villain known as Antimatter is also created and immediately attacks Singularity, but he is defeated soon after. Singularity is believed to be something like the physical embodiment of a black hole. She's capable of flight, teleportation, and even time traveling. Maybe she can go back and fix some of these crazy convoluted timelines. And coming in at number four, Sleeper. Making its first appearance back in 2018, Sleeper is the seventh spawn of Venom. We could find Sleeper's first appearance in Venom issue 18. See, Sleeper is the outcome of a difficult and pretty awful pregnancy. You don't say. There's the link. So Sleeper takes on the host of Tel Kar, a Kree soldier who is very much not alive at this point. Sleeper is terrifying, but just wait until he combines with the other symbiotes and becomes hybrid. Oh my god. In First Host, issue 5, Sleeper saved Eddie Brock by merging with Tel Kar. Saying to Eddie, I lobotomized him. He made my parents his mindless servant. Turnabout seemed like fair play. This body is strong. There are depths of knowledge and memories in this mind. Worlds, galaxies. I've been kept in a cage my whole life, and there's so much to see out there, and I will see it. I know you did your best, father, but I just don't need a cage anymore. And if that's not a badass line, I can tell you what is, really. Readers point out that the length of Telkar's hair actually gives us an idea that this forced symbiosis worked, at least for a bit. One of the best moments with Sleeper has to be at issue 19 when he bonds to Dylan, or at least try to. Number three. Moon Girl. So in 1978, Marvel Comics released the first issue of Devil Dinosaur, accompanied by his partner, Moon Boy, the first human, like the first human ever. This is a prehistoric old school story from Marvel, and it's recently been revamped. In 2015, Marvel released Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur number one, where we meet the next generation, Lunella Lafayette. A super genius child inventor, she becomes obsessed with the Kree and builds a device to study Kree technology, and she has a real talent for inventing gadgets. When one of her teachers accidentally activates a device she invented, it inadvertently opens a portal to another world, and the killer folk from Devil Dinosaur's universe come through to the present day New York with the Devil Beast himself in tow. Luna's studies led her to learning that she was susceptible to the Terrigen mist surrounding the Earth, similar to Mosaic, and she is terrified of Terrigenesis transforming her. She gets kidnapped by the Killer Folk, and Devil Beast comes along and helps her out. She later rescues Devil Beast when he gets captured and kept at the Bronx Zoo, and it's the beginning of a beautiful friendship. She later even earns the ability to swap consciousnesses with the Devil Dinosaur. Of course, with the consciousness of a dinosaur inside of her body, she kind of comes off as a crazy feral beast. One of the coolest things about Moon Girl is that despite her age, she is one of the most genius characters in the Marvel Universe, with a genius intellect rivaling even Bruce Banner. And number two, 
Gibb. Making his first appearance in Runaways Volume 5, Issue 13, Gibb was the last of the Gibrim left on Earth, and he's of course a member of the Runaways now. The seed of the Gibrim discovered the Runaways and were going to demand that they honor their parents' promise which was to inherit the Earth, empowered by the billions of sacrificed souls. Awesome! Well, thankfully the Runaways prevented all that from happening and trapped the Gibram in limbo. See, Gib was tasked to stay with the Runaways and guard them for about a week. So during this time with the Runaways, Gib is like, eh, these guys are pretty cool, maybe I'll stick around, I don't know. And he saw their kindness and compassion, and then when Rim and Bo returned, Gib tried to convince them to forgo the right of thunder. See, Gib has our backs, that's our man right there. All the while, Gert was prepping to send them into the future, like 999 years into the future. Did Black Widow finally come out? Let us know, we're still waiting back here in 2020. We're, you know, we're still waiting. The Runaways welcome Gib with open arms and they even help him find an alternate meal plan, you know, rather than feasting on sacrificed souls. His appearance is pretty epic alone. I mean, his powers, of course, enhance strength, but also shape-shifting. Yeah, Gib matches the appearance of the people surrounding him and apparently his true form would cause eyes to bleed. So if you're playing Marco Polo with Gib, don't want to cheat, trust me, you do not want to cheat. Coming in at number one, we have Emily Bright. Emily just burst onto the scene this year in Marvel's Strange Academy number one. She was actually born with her magical abilities, totally freaking out her parents. She sometimes levitate her toys around and even levitate her dog once. One day, her dog is hit by a car and she winds up healing the animal with her magical abilities. This leads to her contacting Doctor Strange and asking for his help, and she becomes enrolled in his newly created Strange Academy. She receives some high praise from Scarlet Witch on her first day, and by lunchtime, she's used more magic in one day than she's ever used before in her life. I'm loving this new series. It seems to take inspiration from Umbrella Academy and Professor X's School for Gifted Youngsters, and it's really cool just seeing some characters kind of finding themselves and figuring out how exactly they want to use their powers. Number 10, Cloud9, also known as Abigail Gail Boylan. This character made her big debut in Avengers The Initiative in 2007. Abigail was a shy girl from Illinois who came into contact with an alien gas cloud that allowed her to control it. She had no interest in being a hero though, she just wanted to fly around. Destiny soon catches up with her though and War Machine picks her up and recruits her into the initiative, a post-civil war agreement that each of the 50 states have its own superhero squad. She participates in an emergency mission to protect the president from an assassination attempt by Hydra. Fun fact, the president is George Bush in this issue. Cloud9's power is called gaseous aerokinesis meaning she can generate and manipulate gas, creating multiple clouds for a concealing mist effect or using the gas to suffocate others. I also have this ability. Pretty cool stuff, but the gas is mostly used for flight, allowing her to reach speeds up to 600 miles per hour. Number nine, Brenda Drago. First appearing in Spider Girl number 18 in the year 2000, Brenda was forced into a life of crime by her abusive ex-boyfriend. He gave her a suit equipped with functioning wings and she became the flying thief known as Raptor. However, her crime spree is cut short by Spider Girl and the two become fast friends. Similar to Cloud9, she's mostly known for her ability to fly around, but her wings are also razor sharp, making her a formidable aerial opponent. She has been a member of the New Warriors and the Savage Six. She's also married to Spider Girl's friend, Normie Osborne. It's an alternate universe. Hey guys, before I get down to the next one, please take a second and hit that like button. Really helps us out here at Top 10 Nerd. Number eight, Michael Van Patrick. MVP came onto the scene in 2007 in Avengers The Initiative. See, the scientist who created the super soldier serum for Captain America had also researched a revolutionary diet and exercise regimen, which he theorized would create the ultimate soldier but it would require a lifetime of adherence to produce the right results. Well, the US Army basically was like, I want my super soldier now. So the scientist scrapped those plans and he started working on perfecting the super soldier serum. When the scientist eventually died, the research was passed down through his family, eventually ending up in the hands of Brian Van Patrick, who raised his son Michael on the principles of that original research. Michael quickly became one of the greatest athletes in America, but lost it all when he fell under heavy scrutiny due to him being the great grandson of Captain America. It's a tragic hand to be dealt as Michael loses nearly every award he's ever received, even though all of his abilities came from good old fashioned training. He does find his shine however when he joins the initiative and in his training breaks the course record for heroes without super speed. He is pretty awesome but he does unfortunately die later on. Number 7, Luna Snow. Neat story about her, she technically first appears in the mobile game 
Marvel Future Fight, released in 2015. But Luna's first appearance in a comic book was in Marvel's War of the Realms event in 2019. She's a South Korean K-pop singer turned superhero. She was on stage performing at Stark Arena when the area was attacked by Joros Spider and her AIM scientists. Luna and her bandmates are taken hostage and she is held inside a cold fusion reactor. When the reactor malfunctions, Luna receives cryokinetic abilities and she uses them to escape and free her friends, later becoming the hero known as Luna Snow. She later on fights against an invasion of fire demons, freezing the ground beneath them and blasting them with ice shards. Number 6. Roger Brokerage Also known as Hardball, Roger made his debut in Avengers The Initiative in 2007. Roger grew up in Los Angeles and he wasn't happy when his brother Paul received special powers from the Power Broker, a villain who gives superpowers in exchange for a percentage of the money that you make with them. Worse. Paul gets intensely injured and his family starts to greatly suffer under the weight of his medical bills. So Roger is not too happy about this and decides he's going to kill his brother. But in the end he just can't go through with it and decides instead that he's going to kill the power broker. On approaching the power broker however, he is convinced by him to gain some superpowers for himself. And it's super painful but he winds up gaining the ability to create hard balls of light. He sets out on a mission to rob an armored car, but he ends up rescuing a woman instead. Man, this guy always ends up doing something different than he planned. In the end, he helps defend the president against an attack from Hydra and joins the Avengers initiative of Nevada, the heavy hitters. Number 5. Wave Also known as Pearl, she also made her debut in War of the Realms in 2019. She grew up in the Philippines, a promising swimmer with Olympic potential. She was approached in her youth by Alon Tech, a seedy organization that used her swimming expertise for experiments. One day, she is drenched in water that has been exposed to unknown energies and she gains the ability to control water. She is later taken in by a group of heroes who help her learn how to use her new powers becoming the superhero called Wave. She eventually becomes part of Triumph Division, the Southeast Asia initiative. She later confronts the fire giants and their leader Cinder, who senses Wave's elemental power and attempts to lure her away from her homeland. Her hydrokinesis powers allow her to manipulate water in any form, even solid or gas, making her surprisingly powerful. Number 4. Arrow Also called Lei Ling, Arrow made her debut in a self-titled comic in 2018. A Chinese agent from Shanghai, she has powers of aerokinesis, allowing her to generate and control the wind. She was once in a confrontation with Wave from Triumph Division. Like Wave, she had been tricked and lured away from her homeland, leaving it undefended. She is affiliated with the Agents of Atlas alongside 3D Man and Jake O, the new war machine. Her powers allow her to not only fly, but blast bursts of wind from her arms or legs reportedly strong enough to destroy high grade concrete. She also has the ability to solidify the air into shapes like swords or platforms as well as creating air bombs or generating whirlwinds. She has had her powers since she was a child and founded her own architecture firm called Sacred Tree Design. Number 3. Crescent Similar to Luna Snow, this character also first appeared in Marvel's Future Fight mobile game and later appeared in War of the Realms in 2019. Crescent is a child, weighs 60 pounds and is a Taekwondo prodigy. She was there when the agents of Atlas went up against Cinder and her fire giants, but eventually she did become overwhelmed. She has the power of a half moon bear spirit and she uses the power of her mask to avoid fire blasts from the fire demons. There's a lot of cool new characters like her in the War of the Realms storyline. I definitely recommend checking it out. Number 2. White Fox Also known as Amy Han, this character first appeared in Marvel's Contest of Champions in 2015. She is the last of the Kumiho, a mystical shape-shifting nine-tailed fox. Legends say that the fox hunts and seduces men to eat their hearts. Her grandmother was a Kumiho who fell in love with a man and he helped her discover her humanity. She was raised to hide her true form from others and was super good at it, later becoming an intelligence agent for the South Korean government. She once allied with Black Widow and Domino to help destroy the Creation Constellation, an artifact that can turn humans into Celestials. However, the team discovers that White Fox intended to get infected by the Constellation in order to gain cosmic power, so they kick her out of the team. She has incredible superhuman capabilities, the full extent of which is still unknown. And here we are at number one, 
Kamala Khan. She is most notably known as the protagonist in Marvel's new Avengers game, but Kamala Khan originally burst on the scene in 2013 in Captain Marvel Volume 7. Kamala is a Muslim Pakistani American teenager from New Jersey, and she takes up the mantle of Miss Marvel after Carol Danvers. As a child, she made friends with a boy named Bruno, and the two bonded over their shared love of the TV series Tween Mutant Samurai Turtles. One night, she goes to a waterfront party against her parents' wishes, gets made fun of by some mean kids named Zoe and Josh, and she goes home sad. Kamala was traveling home from this party at the same time that the Terrigen Mists blanketed Jersey City, and the mist put her into a coma where she had a vision of Captain Marvel. She awakens from the mist and is shocked to discover she's been transformed into a polymorph, able to change her body into virtually anything. Anything? Struggling to gain control of her powers, she runs around the neighborhood, eventually winding up back at the waterfront. She's just running around freaking out about having superpowers. She gets back to the waterfront and finds Zoe has fallen into the river. She rescues Zoe and feels really good about it until she gets home and is grounded for sneaking out. She later stops a burglary and discovers she has the ability to heal herself from gunshots just by transforming back to her regular form. Some fun facts about Kamala. Her name means perfection in Arabic, and she plays an online game called World of Battlecraft, based on the popular Warcraft games. Number 10, Katie Chen from the MCU. Katie or Ruin Chen is probably one of my favorite new characters in the MCU, if not just my full on favorite now, I think. Katie is the best friend of Sean and grew up with him, but later learns that her friend Sean has a complicated past that he's been running from for basically years. And in fact, Sean's given name was never actually Sean, but instead, Shang-Chi. Katie might not have superpowers, but she comes with a can do attitude, no matter the odds. We also learn Learned that despite the fact that Katie works as a valet alongside Sean, that she actually graduated from Berkeley, but isn't really doing much with her college degree. Katie loves driving fast and karaoke, a woman after my own heart. Number 9, L'Oreal. Not to be confused with L'Oreal, which is a brand. Just to be clear, Lori L is the sister of Captain Marvel, who first appeared in issue 18 of the current Captain Marvel series, which started back in 2019. She was genetically bred by Kree scientists who created her to be a powerful warrior using the DNA of two accomplished Kree warriors who came before her, one of which was Carol Danvers' mother, Mari L. That makes Lori L Carol's full Kree half sister. Carol was working as an accuser when she first ran into Lori L and was tasked with apprehending and executing her, as she was believed to be the Kree responsible for a large massacre. Carol learned of Lori L's parentage and believed her to be innocent, so instead spirited her away until she could locate the person who was truly responsible for the massacre. After the events of Empire, where the two sisters fought side by side, Lori L ended up becoming Emperor Hulkling's new accuser, taking Carol's place. Also Lori L, fun fact, is really really funny, and if you get to read her as Emperor for Hulkling's accuser, you'll see what I'm talking about. <laughs> Number 8, Werewolf by Night. The new Werewolf by Night is known as Jake Gomez. He made his first appearance in the newest Werewolf by Night series in issue number 1. Jake discovers as a teenager that he can transform into a wolf during the night, no full moon necessary. Jake ends up wrestling with his werewolf form, attempting to use it to do some good for his people while struggling to be in full control of himself while transformed. Jake is supported by his sister Molly, who helps him by using music, creating playlists to help soothe him, allowing him to gain more control and his grandmother. Number 7, Zhu Xiaoling from the MCU. Zhu Xiaoling is the sister of Shang-Chi, who appears in his self-titled feature film. We learn that despite the fact that her father never felt it would be appropriate to train her, at night she would practice in secret, watching his elite soldiers, known as the Ten Rings during the day, and attempting to teach herself their movements during the night. Like her brother Shang-Chi, she also became a woman on the run. However, for Xiaoling, instead of running from her potential destiny, she attempts to seize for her herself the role she feels was denied to her growing up. It's likely that the Shang-Chi film won't be the last that we'll see of this new Marvel Cinematic Universe character, and that she won't necessarily be quite as black and white as some of the other Marvel characters that we've come to know. Which I'm so ready for. I love when characters have so much depth. Number 6, Black Winter. Black Winter is going to be a huge big bad that will be coming our way eventually in the comics. Likely much later on, like we're talking a few years away. Black Winter isn't actually a completely new character, but has recently been reinvented in terms of their part as one of the biggest bads 
ever faced in the comics. Black Winter actually first appeared under the name The Creeping Plague back in the 60s in Thor issue 169. But more recently in 2019, the entity appeared under a new name in Silver Surfer Black issue number 4, becoming known as Black Winter. The entity can take on any shape or form it pleases and is responsible for ending Galactus's home universe. The Black Winter will also likely be the way the current Marvel Universe ends. While Thor and Galactus teamed up in the beginning of the current Thor run, Volume 6, Johnny Cates' run, to destroy the Black Winter, Thor really only succeeded in temporarily defeating the entity, leaving Thor with visions of a bleak end to come, which includes the return of Thanos. Alright friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to learn about more of the newest characters that we've seen in the last ooh, year or two, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. There's, there's lots of new characters. There's lots more people I want to talk to you about, so please give it a thumbs up. Share it. Get it the view so I can give you the video. Number 5. Yelena Belova from the MCU Yelena Belova is like the little sister of Black Widow in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Though, to be clear, she isn't blood related to Natasha. Or not that we know of anyways. It turns out both Yelena and Natasha were part of a team of undercover Russian operatives and spies who are posing as an all-American family as their cover. They were in the US to gain important scientific intel when they were kids that the head of the Red Room, Drakov, wanted to ultimately help expand and grow his empire. Yelena was posing as Natasha's little sister when they were undercover. Even after Black Widow became an Avenger and thought that she had actually taken down the Red Room, it was revealed that Yelena actually remained a spy and operative for the secret organization due to the fact that earlier on, Black Widow and Hawkeye had actually failed to complete that mission to destroy the organization in Budapest. Yelena will likely be taking over and becoming a sort of White Widow, if you will, in the MCU. At least that's what I think we're going to know her as. Working on a team that Contessa Valentina Allegra de la Fontaine is putting together. In the comics, Yelena is a bit of a different character. She is a rival of Black Widow's who is sometimes an ally and sometimes a foe, depending on the circumstances. And as far as I know, she's never worn quite as cool of a vest as her MCU counterpart. Though she was a model at one point. That was a thing that happened. Number 4. Genesis Genesis is a pretty important character who apparently has always existed, but who we never really knew about. Ooh, mysteries. She made her first full appearance in the 2019 run of X-Men back in issue 12. We would learn that she is the wife of Apocalypse, who was long ago lost to her husband, who ended up leaving another mutant island nation known as Araka. The other half, it turns out, of Krakoa. Genesis is a strong warrior and an all around badass, basically pretty much exactly what you'd expect Apocalypse's wife to be. She also happens to be a mother, as it turns out that Apocalypse and Genesis together had a whole family of strong, also badass mutant children. Currently, Genesis and Apocalypse are back together and are likely taking a little off panel vacation, as we haven't really seen them in a little while. So I hope they're enjoying themselves. <laughs> Hope they're getting a time to reconnect because they've been apart for so long. Number 3, Shang-Chi from the MCU. Shang-Chi first appeared in the comics back in the 70s, but it took him 13 years to make his way into the MCU from when it started way back in 2008. Simu Liu is the actor to take up the role of this new hero in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Shang-Chi is introduced in his own self-titled feature film Shang-Chi and the Legend of 10 Rings, where no major plot spoilers here, no major plot spoilers. We learn that he is a man running from the past, living under the alias of Sean in the United States, after escaping the supposed wrath of his father, criminal overlord Wen Wu. We follow him on his journey as he is suddenly recalled home, back to his family under mysterious circumstances, all while uncovering his family's story, history, and the Legend of the Ten Rings. If you haven't seen Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings yet, I actually cannot recommend this movie more. I think it actually may have become one of my all time favorite films, both within and without the MCU. That, that is just how great it is. I cannot praise it enough. If you haven't seen it yet, like pause this video, go watch it, and then come back. That's how good it is. You gotta go right now. Number two, Venom. That's right, there is a new Venom in town. This one is the son of Eddie Brock and his ex wife, Anne Wayne. His name is Dylan, Dylan Brock. Dylan's existence at first was a shock to Eddie, and it also seemed as though Venom was involved in his genetic creation as well, being that Venom was bonded to Eddie at the time of Dylan's conception. Dylan and Eddie both, however, managed to survive past the crazy summer event that was absolute carnage, where he resurrected 
resurrected Cletus Cassidy as a Grendel symbiote version of Carnage threatened to awaken the god of symbiotes, Null, who would threaten the entire Earth. While Eddie did manage to save his son Dylan, he could not avoid waking Null, who then arrived on Earth during another summer event, Marvel's King in Black event. With Null defeated, Eddie took his place as the god and ruler of symbiotes, and the Venom symbiote was tasked with keeping an eye on Dylan. Dylan has since bonded with the Venom symbiote, and together the two are now the new Venom. So you can enjoy that. Kids grow up so fast in comics, they don't get to be kids for very long, do they? Number 1. Kang the Conqueror from the MCU Kang is a character that I really never would have expected to see in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but it's happened and I gotta say, I'm like weirdly hyped about it. Kang made his first appearance in the season 1 finale of Marvel's streaming series Loki, where he was played by Jonathan Majors. We already knew to expect Jonathan Majors as the character, but didn't anticipate him to show up so early in that role. Instead expecting him to arrive in the MCU in Ant-Man and the Wasp's film Quantumania, where he was believed to be the major villain. It turns out however, that there isn't just one Kang, but infinite Kangs across the multiverse. One of these Kangs was the one behind Behind the Time Variance Authority, or the TVA, it turns out, but now that it has been toppled, this has allowed multiple realities with other, possibly even more sinister, powerful, and ruthless Kangs to spring up. So get ready for some Kang mania, it sounds like. Also, we need a Kang movie because I, I want Quantum Mania and I want like Kang Mania to also be a movie now. Number 10, Miss Marvel. Miss Marvel was once Carol Danvers and is now Kamala Khan. And of course, for this list, we're focusing on Kamala, who was a new addition to the Avengers team in 2015, after making her first unnamed appearance only two years earlier in 2013 in the comics. Kamala is a huge Carol Danvers fan, which is what inspired her to take up the mantle Miss Marvel after Carol dropped it, taking up the Captain Marvel mantle instead herself. Kamala as Miss Marvel has powers which allow her to alter her body's physiology, allowing her to stretch, change size and shape, and in theory, straight up shapeshift. Her powers come from inhuman heritage, which was activated by her exposure to the Terrigen Bomb. Kamala joined the team for a time during all new, all different Avengers, and remains a fan favorite hero at Marvel Comics. And to clarify before we move on to point 9, this is going to be a list of Avengers that have recently come onto the team, as opposed to new Avengers, which is kind of its own thing. There's a lot of new Avengers, so I just want to clarify that. Number 9. Wasp Not the same Wasp who years ago was actually the leader of the Avengers for a while. Nuh uh, we are not talking about Janet Van Dyne here, we are talking about Nadia Van Dyne, who despite her seemingly misleading name, is actually the daughter of Hank Pym and his first wife, Maria Travoya. After her mother Maria was kidnapped and later killed, Nadia ended up being raised in the Red Room, considered a valuable asset due to her natural aptitude for science and academia, believed to be somewhat in part due to the fact that she was was Hank's naturally born daughter. Nadia would eventually escape the Red Room and attempt to locate her father in the US, only to find out that he had recently died during a fight against Ultron. Nadia felt compelled to meet her stepmother, Janet, desiring to become the new Wasp. The two ended up getting along well, and Janet even gave Nadia her blessing to take her last name, seeing her as family. Hence, Nadia became both Nadia Van Dyne and the new Wasp, also going on to join the Avengers team. Number 8. Spider-Man Peter Parker as Spider-Man has of course teamed up with the Avengers before, but Miles Morales as Spider-Man is a newer addition, not just in terms of the Avengers team, but also still relatively new in terms of him existing in 616. Miles Morales is originally a Spider-Man who hails from the Ultimate Comics line originating in Earth 1610, the Ultimate Universe. He was given a new home on Earth 616 after his world had been destroyed as a result of showing kindness to and sharing food with Molecule Man during the Secret Wars event. True story. Thank goodness for pocket cheeseburgers. Miles has a power set very similar to Peter's in many ways, but also has a few unique abilities of his own. He can shock his opponents with venom blasts and can sneak up on them with his spider camouflage, which he can use to appear invisible. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to learn about even more newest additions to the Avengers we've seen in recent years, be sure to give this video a thumbs up. 
Number 7. Valkyrie Valkyrie is Jane Foster, who was originally known as Thor when she joined the Avengers team the first time around. Jane ended up becoming the new Thor after Thor Odinson, the original Thor, was deemed unworthy. As the new Mighty Thor, editorially referred to at times as Lady Thor, Jane joined the Avengers team in the all new, all different Avengers series in 2015. Currently in the comics, Jane is no longer the Mighty Thor, but was welcomed into Asgardia by Odin, who gave her a new title and power set, making her a new Valkyrie. To clarify, I'm saying Asgardia because she was kind of like welcome to the whole world of Asgard, but she didn't like go like live on Asgard or anything specific like that. Currently, Valkyrie is the mantle that she uses. Being imbued with the spirit of Valkyrie Brunhilde gives Jane the strength and power set of an Asgardian warrior. In addition, there are specific powers that are also granted to Valkyries like herself. She can teleport, has death perception, and can see ghosts in addition to being a super strong and capable fighter. Number 6. Starbrand I kind of miss when Brandy was just like a little Starbrand baby. But of course, this is comics and heroes can't stay babies forever. In fact, they can't even stay a baby for more than a year apparently. Especially if they're joining the Avengers, which I kind of get. Technically, the young Starbrand baby Selby, later given the first name Brandy, was in the care of the Avengers. Not really specifically on the team, kind of sort of like their ward. But despite being one of the youngest heroes to ever be affiliated with that team, this little Starbrand also would often help the team out on missions, being so insanely powerful. Starbrand possesses THE Starbrand, which grants her a great amount of basically cosmic power. She is capable of interstellar flight and flight in general, energy manipulation and projection, creating energy blasts, and technically should also be super durable and have some level of healing factor. The Starbrand's power is believed to be potentially infinite when it comes to their power levels, making Starbrand one of the most powerful members on the team. In baby form, child form, or young adult form, as she currently is, as of the end of issue 52 of the current 2018 Avengers series. Number 5. Ghost Rider While Starbrand might have the greatest potential for power, and we aren't sure entirely what she's capable of just yet, Robbie Reyes is a bit more experienced when it comes to his powers. And even when he was less experienced, he actually accidentally killed one of the previous Starbrands, Kevin Connor, in Marvel Legacy. So for those reasons, I thought we should give him a bit of a boost when it comes to his ranking on this list. Robbie Reyes first appeared in the comic scene in 2014 in all new Ghost Rider issue number one. He is an all new Ghost Rider just like the series claims. During a street race gone wrong, Robbie was killed and ended up possessed by the ghost who haunted the car that he was driving, becoming the new Ghost Rider. He joined up with the Avengers recently in the comics and I think he makes a great addition to the team. I personally love Robbie Reyes. so. Yeah, I'm here for it. Number 4. Winter Hulk While Jennifer Walters as She-Hulk may have joined the Avengers long ago, first joining up back in the 80s, she has gone through a lot of changes since then. One recent and major one which also returned her to her smaller, smarter, more playful and sassy yet still very powerful form happened recently in Avengers comics. For a brief time, She-Hulk, then known as Just Hulk, ended up becoming Winter Hulk. Winter Hulk happened as a result of Jen allowing herself to be kidnapped by the Winter Guard of Russia to try and figure out what they were up to. What devious things are they planning? In the end, they attempted to mind wipe and brainwash Hulk to turn her into one of their agents. And uh, they kind of succeeded. Although the process was interrupted, for a brief time Jen acted as their agent, Winter Hulk. However, as Winter Hulk, Jen still managed to fight against her programming, and alert her fellow Avengers when sent to attack Namor and Atlantis. In the end, Winter Hulk was forced to absorb a ton of radiation to protect the citizens of Atlantis. She managed to discharge the gamma radiation she had absorbed safely, and as a result was returned to her original form, ultimately deciding to retire from the Avengers team after these events and return to practicing law. And now we have a new She-Hulk series that I have heard nothing but good things about. I really need to get reading my first issue. <laughs> Number 3. Phoenix While Phoenix is definitely one of the most powerful superheroes to be on the Avengers team, her history with them is a bit more lengthy than you might initially think. 
which is why I ranked her a little bit lower on this list than I normally would. Phoenix herself was back on the original Avengers team, the prehistoric Avengers, or the Avengers of 1 million BC. This avatar for Phoenix was known as Fire Hair. However, Fire Hair only made her first appearance even in 2017 in the comics. So she's also kind of new in a way, even though she's super old. Does that make sense? Maya Lopez, aka Echo, is the current host of the Phoenix Force and the current Phoenix, who also finds herself on the Avengers team. Her being Phoenix is new, but her being on the Avengers team is not new. She rejoined the team in 2021 as Phoenix, which is quite new, like I said, but she actually was a member of the Avengers way back in 2005, when she was using the mantle of Ronin. Still, Maya being Phoenix and being part of the Avengers altogether is quite fresh right now, despite both the Phoenix Force's history with the prehistoric team and Maya's own history with the present day team. And of course, Phoenix is one of the most powerful entities in the entire Marvel Universe. So despite her being kind of a new, old combo thing, we have to show respect to the blazingly brilliant and powerful Maya Lopez, aka Echo, aka Phoenix, on this list. Number 2. Cable Nathan Summers ended up joining the Avengers team at a time when Captain America was seeking to present a show of unity. Hence, Cable ended up being on the Avengers Unity Division, which was meant to bring together Avengers and X-Men after events of Avengers vs X-Men had created tension between the two superhero groups of Earth. Series-wise, the team was known as the Uncanny Avengers, with Cable joining up as early as issue number 4. Cable is an extremely powerful telepath and telekinetic due to him being the offspring of X-Men member Cyclops and his wife at the time, Mr. Sinister created clone of Jean Grey, Madeline Pryor. Despite Maddie being his birth mother, Jean has also been like a mother to Nate after she was implanted with the memories of basically raising him, making her kind of like his telepathically retcon mom, with Maddie becoming more like a surrogate mother in terms of her relationship with Nate, formerly known to her as Baby Christopher. Oh, baby Christopher. Number one, Avenger Prime. Avenger Prime is kind of like all of the Avengers merged together. At least, that's what the original version of this character was like. They made their first appearance in the 2013 Mighty Avengers series, but another character with that name also recently reappeared in the 2021 free comic book day Avengers and Hulk comic. They showed up in the Avengers portion of that double feature story comic. Here, Avengers Prime is the leader of the Deathlock Avengers forces, who basically stands guard at the God Quarry, seeking to watch, protect, and warn against major multiversal threats and potential chrono collapses. Presumably, this is some version of Avenger Prime that decided to stay omnipotent and bonded together. At least that's what I'm assuming. Some people are assuming different things. When we saw Avenger Prime last, or an alternate version of them, if you will, they were created using a ritual which allowed the team of Mighty Avengers to bond together. Technically, Avenger Prime stands to be the most powerful of the Avengers, as they should be made up of one or more teams or rosters potentially combined together. Now, of course, some people believe that Avenger Prime is actually some sort of alternate version or uh, some future version of Tony Stark, aka Iron Man, but we don't really know for sure yet. Whoever they are, though, they definitely seem to have a lot of time, a lot of power, and a lot of resources on their hands, especially for being a shadowy figure. At number 10, we have Justice, FK a Marvel boy. Although he's known as a pretty well respected hero, at least in his later years, Justice still doesn't do much for the Avengers during his time with them. When he first joins, he comes off as more of a fan than anything else, making some rookie mistakes right off the bat. He also finds a way to break his leg, which isn't very common for a superhero. Much of his lack of maturity in the group is due to his worship for the other members of the Avengers, so it's hard to blame him, although he does do some pretty good work in planning to take down Ultron. Later, he ends up teaching for the Avengers Academy alongside Hank Pym, Tiger, Quicksilver, and Speedball. But overall, this character's time with the Avengers is wrought with scattered accomplishments and distracting love triangle storylines that just make him a much less effective member of the team. At number 9, we have Sandman. Although his redemption arc is really great and has so much potential, it sort of falls flat. Basically, the Thing one day sits Sandman down and tries to turn him to the good side 
And it works. With Sandman now finding his stride as a hero, he first joins the Outlaws, a team of reformed Spider-Man enemies, and is then given a membership to the Avengers. It's all going in the right direction for the former villain until he's promptly hypnotized by Wizard and turned back to the dark side. Honestly, this isn't even Sandman's fault, but his quick turn back to evil gets in the way of him being anything close to a functional member of the Avengers. I almost didn't even put him on the list just because he barely even does anything for the team after he's inducted. And even tragically after that, he even goes off to reform the Sinister Six right after leaving the Avengers Reserve, which basically erases any good he may have done during his time as an Avenger. At number 8 is Sentry, who joins the Mighty Avengers after having one foot in the door of the New Avengers for a while. This guy is a poor addition to the team simply based on issues of power imbalance and, unfortunately, his own mental health. On the power side of things, he's so powerful that he sort of drowns out the efforts of the Avengers as a team, which in many ways is a good problem to have. But on top of this, due to his mental health issues, he tends to have trouble reining in his power set and often second guesses himself. I feel badly for the Sentry, and I only put him on this list because sometimes people just aren't right for a big team. When it becomes clear that Sentry is fighting some internal battles, he is still known as the most powerful member of the team, but just needs to figure himself out first. For example, at one point, Sentry attacks Ultron at a moment when the team needed him to hold back, and sort of ruins the whole plan. Although the attack was in retaliation for Ultron seemingly killing his wife, so it's not that unexpected. It's just one of the many times that Sentry has troubles keeping his composure and taking on the responsibilities of an Avenger. He's not a bad hero, just maybe not right for the best superhero alliance ever created. At number seven, we have US Agent, or John Walker, formerly a stand-in for Captain America. His true colors show when Steve Rogers returns and Walker is renamed US Agent, which is just a bunko name if you ask me. I had to put him on the list even though he does the honorable deed of taking over as Captain America when Steve Rogers goes a wall and becomes nomad. He's just a little too intense on the patriotism front and brings the team down as a result. A huge part of Steve Rogers' influence on the Avengers is his ability to shelve the burden of America's unofficial, but basically official superhero, and keep his intentions focused on acting in favor of others. He's able to put aside his pride and work for the team, whereas Walker does the opposite. He does work for the team, but it's a big lesson in the importance of good attitude because they have the same powers, but something about John Walker's suffocating patriotism and inherent arrogance that comes with it just proves that no one could do the job like Steve could. And once again, US Agent is just such a lame name to take on, unrelated. Especially after having gone as Captain America for a time, it's just, maybe I just feel badly for him in a way. At number six, we have Swordsman. With the biggest accolade being that he trains Hawkeye, it's hard not to squeeze this guy onto the list. Basically, Swordsman starts off as a circus performer who is known for demonstrating his mastery with bladed weaponry. He was more of a showman than a superhero realistically, and also more of a villain than a superhero, if we're being honest. After losing all his money due to his gambling addiction, he decides to steal from the carnival paymaster, and when a young Hawkeye chases him, Swordsman almost kills his own apprentice. And then, fast forwarding, the way that he's eventually admitted into the Avengers is basically through fraud. He teams up with Mandarin and sends a fake message posing as Iron Man to the Avengers to allow himself into the group. And it works. Being a double agent for Mandarin, he later lures the Avengers into a with the intention of blowing them up. Although he does try to dismantle it in a moment of regret, he's still dejected from the Avengers anyway. I think they just sensed he was screwing around with them. He then basically just falls back into a life of crime while picking up a drinking habit along the way which isn't part of the reason I put him on the list. It's kind of sad. He's a very troubled character and just had some nasty intentions and tendencies. Not the most noble of the Avengers by any means. At number five, we have Jack of Hearts. This guy is notoriously one of the worst Avengers because his most notable act as part of the team is murdering another one of the members. Although he does this while under the influence of Scarlet Witch, there's no hiding from something so brutal. I mean, the Avenger he kills is Ant-Man, who's a really important member of the team. Aside from this though, Jack of Hearts also just spends such a short time with the Avengers that even his heroic deeds are sort of weak, regardless of the tragedy. Being the 52nd member of the Avengers, he's brought on specifically to help take on Kang the Conqueror. They all team up with the Justice League and a huge battle goes down. 
and then promptly after this, Jack tragically decides he needs to end his own life for various reasons, taking a villain with him who had killed Ant-Man's daughter. But it's pretty ironic that the next time he makes an appearance, he blows himself up and takes Ant-Man with him. Just a messy run as an Avenger through and through. At number four, we have Stingray. This guy isn't ever really a true member of the Avengers. He is officially, but he only seems to jump on as part of the group when they need him, like when they need access to his underwater hydro base or when an inverted Doctor Doom brings him on to rescue civilians from a river. He's sort of their fringe friend that they use for water related issues. Could this be a case of lazy writing? Perhaps. But it seems more like he's not really a strong enough character to do much more than pop in and out of the scene when water gets involved. He also almost fights Iron Man due to a misunderstanding right when he joins the team and even campaigns to have him removed from the Avengers which is just an awful way to start. At number three is Star Fox. This guy is just a bad hero. He's not even really a hero. His powers are extremely problematic in that he can basically gain the love of a woman on command. But it's not really love because it's artificial and it only lasts for so long. So when he uses his powers, these women often wake up not knowing where they are or what they've done, which is naturally a pretty deplorable thing to inflict on a person with your powers. And he doesn't even seem to feel badly after it either. He just gets his clothes on and jumps out the window like, See you later. Good luck piecing together the last 12 hours. Otherwise known as Eros of Titan, this guy is actually Thanos' older brother, so this sort of explains the evil nature of his powers. At least in the comics, they're kind of aware of his nasty nature, because the woman who he's used his powers on eventually come out and sue him because of what he does, which has to be a first for a superhero. I'm honestly just surprised that this dude even had a membership to the Avengers in the first place. He just, just kind of sucks. At number two is D-Man or Demolition man. This dude should never really have been brought on to join the Avengers. He's sort of just this unmotivated, scraggly guy with a horribly designed suit. He just steals Wolverines and Daredevil's costumes and makes a tragic mashup of the two. His origins are that he's basically a wrestler that was given superhuman strength before befriending Captain America. When Cap needs to reform the Avengers, he thinks it's a good idea to bring on D-Man to join the team. But this choice is pretty obviously out of sympathy empathy for the guy because he doesn't really do much when he does join. He's then sort of left behind and lost in time, becoming more and more unmotivated as the years go on, eventually living in homelessness before becoming a sort of villain. Not the best track record for even an alum of the Avengers. But I can't totally rag on him. The Avengers have insanely high standards and some people just want to hang out and eat sub sandwiches. So that's D-Man. The number one spot on this list goes to Dr. Druid. Having been trained under the same mentor who trained Doctor Strange, you'd think this guy would have gone on to be a great member of the Avengers. Well, at first he wasn't actually known as such a bad hero by his own right, but after joining the team, it becomes pretty obvious that he wasn't destined for greatness. His attitude is arrogant, he carries a lot of insecurity about living in Strange's shadow for so long, and he also has a big weakness to the charm of women, proving him to have a pretty low emotional intelligence. And this is a pretty major fault when you're supposed to be an Avenger because you need to be able to have a strong character regardless of whatever your power set is. This also tends to lead him to be a subordinate to women in positions of power like Captain Marvel, who he continually undermines until his disloyalty leads to her being seriously injured in battle. He then tries to convince everyone to name him the successor as the new chairman. This guy, Dr. Druid, was just kind of a weak-minded, fool who is conniving and subordinate through and through. It's surprising he was ever brought on board with the Avengers because he really proves himself to be one of their weakest links while he's there. Coming in at number 10 is Captain America. No, Captain America is not near the top of the power hierarchy of Avenger heroes. Not by a long shot, but it's not his power that makes him unstoppable. It's his willpower. Captain America just never gives up or backs down when he believes in what he is fighting for. This is one of the big reasons that Steve Rogers has been the leading man of the Avengers. That and his genius tactical mind and his leadership skills. Almost all the Marvel heroes and even some of the Marvel villains will shut up and listen when Captain America speaks, even when those heroes and villains are leagues and bounds above Steve in terms of their power. In addition to all that, Captain America is one of the longest lasting and most popular of the Marvel heroes, and that fact also lends him some points in the unstoppability factor on the publishing side of Marvel heroes. 
But on top of all of that, Captain America is one hell of a fighter and is incredibly tough with his super soldier serum bringing him to the very tippy top of the human conditioning and making him a physically perfect human which has allowed him to withstand some pretty brutal attacks, being frozen in ice for decades and has virtually stopped his aging. And at number 9 is Spider-Man. Just like Captain America, Spider-Man has the absolute god level of power known as popularity. He is essentially the face of Marvel Comics and almost everyone who just knows of comic books knows of Spider-Man. Sure, Spider-Man has been defeated and even lost his life, like how he is technically currently not alive, but he always comes back and there is a very low possibility that he will ever be brought down for good. Plus, now we have Miles Morales as well, who is going to share this spot on the list, even if he's got a few abilities that Peter doesn't have. Spider-Man has got more than popularity though. He is also very inspiring, actually really strong, and incredibly Incredibly intelligent. He is seen and respected as one of the most righteous and brave heroes around, and his heroic attitude, sense of responsibility, almost perfect moral compass, and quick wit make him beloved by not only fans but other heroes and even some villains. But above all of that, it's his willpower that I think makes him truly unstoppable. Even in the face of certain death, Spider Man will always get back to his feet, which has allowed him to use his incredible abilities to perform truly incredible feats. Speaking of his powers, Spider-Man possesses the proportional powers of a spider, but he's done things that even a human-sized spider would not be able to do, and his spider sense gives him an edge in battle, and that, combined with his other abilities, has made him next to unstoppable. In at number 8 is Luke Cage. Criminal turned unstoppable superhero is quite the feat, but Luke Cage handles that with grace, becoming a pillar of his community, and even eventually becoming mayor of New York itself. Whenever I think of Luke Cage, the word unstoppable is what actually comes to mind. I just think of him as this big brick wall just standing in the way of anyone who would try to harm another person. Luke went through a super soldier experiment known as the Burstein process, which increased his cellular regeneration rate. This means that Luke was given a level of super strength that, with training and experience, has made him strong enough to lift 50 tons. But there have been times where he exceeded this and his strength lets him perform thunderclaps, leap incredible distances, and he's even been able to grab onto the back of an aeroplane and force it to come to a complete stop. Alongside his strength, he was obviously given superhuman stamina to match, but what most know him for is his nigh invulnerability. Luke's skin, muscles, and bone tissue is about as hard as titanium steel, making him basically immune to bullets and blades. He can withstand hits of around 1 ton and blasts of 150 pounds of TNT, but those numbers wax and wane depending on the story. He has taken hits from people far stronger than himself and survived falls from 90 stories. If Peter Parker is the heart of New York City, Luke Cage is the bulwark. And at number 7 is Wolverine. Of course an overly aggressive and angry Canadian will make this list. An angry Canadian is already such a rare occurrence that they have to be pretty strong and Wolverine definitely is. Most people are well aware of Wolverine's abilities thanks to Hugh Jackman, but I am honor bound to explain them anyways. There are two things that make Wolverine practically unstoppable. The first would be his adamantium lace skeleton and by extension his claws. While not a natural occurrence, Wolverine was subjected to the Weapon X program and for him he was given the adamantium which bonded to his skeleton infusing it with his bones which makes them virtually unbreakable. It also makes his claws razor sharp and gives him added weight and velocity when throwing punches and kicks. Now, if someone were to ever break his bones, which is pretty much impossible, it wouldn't really matter because one of his natural mutations is a healing factor that is only outmatched by a few other characters in the Marvel Universe. His healing factor has allowed him to survive a nuclear explosion, being completely crushed by a steamroller, having his heart torn out, brutal and bloody fights with Sabretooth, he has even recovered from a single drop of blood, but he was being powered up at that time. His skeleton and his healing factor are just compounded by incredible senses, superhuman attributes and general tough guy attitude to make him a pretty unstoppable member of the Avengers and more. In at number 6 is Ghost Rider. Everybody loves Ghost Rider. Doesn't matter who it is, a flaming skull and a flaming mount is just always cool. 
But not only is he really cool, he's quite a hardy fella. He is essentially impervious to almost all forms of normal damage, or the damage he has sustained, like having his head completely obliterated, didn't actually matter since he just instantly reformed it and didn't even feel it. The Ghost Rider has tanked hits from the Hulk on multiple different occasions and was one of the main heroes called in when Hulk returned for his vengeance on the Illuminati. Since his body becomes a flaming skeleton, most projectiles just pass straight through him or bounce off of his incredibly strong bones. The only things that have ever been shown to actually hurt him are heaven forged or blessed weapons. Also, because of the divine or demonic energies that empower him, he can basically feel no fatigue or pain of any kind, and if anything were to actually damage him, he can recover from his injuries insanely quickly, almost instantly. But all that combined with his hellfire, soul and sim manipulation, demonic magic, fallible penance stare and other insane abilities makes Ghost Rider someone who most villains and even heroes fear even on their best days. At number 5 is Carol Danvers. Whether you love or hate Carol Danvers, there is no denying this energy wielding superhero is an absolute powerhouse. Carol was the head of security at NASA when she was accidentally subjected to the Psyche Magnetron machine, which imprinted her with energy from Marvel's Kree Negabands. This basically means she was given superhuman strength that allowed her to support the weight of a dead celestial, super stamina that lets her exert herself for 20 for hours before getting tired, superhuman durability to withstand planet destroying explosions, superhuman agility and reflexes that are next to instant, a regenerative healing factor that exceeds Wolverines and can be extended to others, self propelled flight at three times the speed of sound, even in the vacuum of space, and flash precognition that allows her to randomly subconsciously anticipate the moves of her opponents. But all of this is somewhat secondary to what is arguably her main power. The the ability to control, absorb, and manipulate energy of a whole bunch of different kinds. This extends to let her project her spirit, manipulate molecules, and transmute matter. She can create energy constructs and even boost up her already OP abilities. And at number 4 is the Hulk. It's almost a requirement that the Hulk show up on this list. The gamma powered green goliath has been around for a long time, and ever since he showed up there are only a small handful of people who have ever been able to stop him without using some kind of magic or reality warping. His infinite strength has a lot to do with that. A strength that grows based on his anger and has never ever really reached a cap, allowing him to destroy entire planets, be a threat to entire galaxies, and being able to shake the multiverse with his punches. It also has a lot to do with his basically limitless dynamic durability, which has allowed him to survive attacks from enchanted weapons, powerful blasts of energy, stronger than ground zero nuclear explosions, the human torch's nova blast, and he could stand up to forces that could crush adamantium and destroy entire planets. But now, thanks to Immortal Hulk, we know that the Hulk actually literally cannot die, coming back from the below place through green doors. Actually, in that story we even get to see an alternate future where the one below all uses the Hulk to destroy literally everything in existence. And the Hulk is still showing more and more of his potential, with the reveal of the Titan personality that was able to fire energy blasts and is utter nightmare fuel. And at number 3 is the Scarlet Witch. As a natural conduit of one of the most powerful forms of dark magic, chaos magic, the Scarlet Witch, Wanda Maximoff, is one of the most terrifyingly powerful beings in Marvel Comics. Using her chaos magic, Wanda has the very powerful ability to alter reality, which she has used to create her own children, bring the Avengers to their knees and even completely end a few of them, and even rewrite all of reality to make mutants the dominant species for a while before wiping a ton of them out. When she was born, Wanda had a natural affinity for magic. Now this was boosted up by the gift or curse of chaos magic given to her by Cthone, the old god of chaos, which was then boosted up again by the experiments of the high evolutionary at Wondergore Mountain, which gave her an even deeper connection to magic. She can channel energy from other dimensions and from entities like Cthone, Sidorak, and Morrigan, and is considered to be the nexus being of the universe. Most magic users could make this list, but few of them can do what the Scarlet Witch can do. And at number two is Thor. 
Thor Odinson, the Asgardian God of Thunder, is one of the most powerful heroes on the Avengers roster. Whenever anyone talks about Avengers level threats, one of the key elements of that is whether Thor can handle the situation alone. In both the comics and the MCU, Thor and the Hulk are repeatedly given reasons to not be able to show up so that certain storylines can actually be compelling. Specifically, I'm talking about Civil War, where Thor had to deal with Ragnarok back home on Asgard. And that was all because if he was on Earth during Civil War, whoever had him on their side would automatically win. Being the son of Odin the Allfather and Gaia, an old god, Thor has all the incredible powers of the Asgardians, but boosted to a whole other level thanks to his mom. As the god of strength as well as thunder, he is one of the strongest Marvel characters, being able to either defeat or stalemate astronomically strong beings like the Midgard Serpent, the Hulk, the Silver Surfer, Gladiator, and Hercules. His stamina lets him basically fight forever, and he's next to completely invulnerable. Not to mention his weather and energy manipulation and the use of his hammer. Even when he isn't in the possession of his hammer though, and is just Thor Odinson, he is still a force to be reckoned with. And, especially recently, he keeps getting more and more power boosts, like when he was Rune King Thor, or now that he's Allfather Thor, which gives him the Thor Force. And he's gone even beyond that when he became the Herald of Galactus. There's a lot more to Thor, but I think, I think I've said enough. And finally, in at number one, is the Sentry. With the power of a million exploding suns, Robert Reynolds, the Sentry, is not just another Marvel version of Superman. In my opinion, he is even cooler than Superman. And you can get at me in the comments for that. The Golden Sentry Serum gave Robert Reynolds more than just the highest level of strength in the universe, the ability to move and fly faster than the speed of light or just straight up teleport, and near invulnerability. The Sentry also has molecular manipulation abilities that have allowed him to defeat the Molecule Man, photokinesis which allows him to shine brighter than the sun, turn completely invisible, and produce blasts of light from his hands and eyes that could burn the Hulk's skin and level whole city blocks. He also has psionic abilities that he uses to hold himself together, implant his memories in others, erase memories, and stop the Hammer of Thor. He also has biokinesis abilities that have let him heal others resurrect himself, reconstitute his molecules, and as the Void, give others cancer. Speaking of the Void, that is a whole other dark side to this hero that is intrinsically tied to his existence, which is not only incredibly powerful in its own right and makes the hero 10 times more interesting, but when the Sentry combined with the Void, this godlike being somehow got a huge power boost. Number 10. It's Punisher. When US Marine veteran Frank Castle's family was dispatched for witnessing a mob hit, Frank vowed to avenge their deaths and become a one-man army in his personal war against crime. He became the vigilante known as the Punisher. He's quite impressive for a regular dude. Castle is in peak physical condition and is able to access and adapt to just about any situation and turn it to his advantage, using only his skills and killer instinct. He has a very high threshold for pain, able to undergo surgery without any kind of of anesthesia, and he can take multiple shots and stab wounds and continue fighting. He can even take hits from superheroes and villains with superhuman strength and just keep on going. The Punisher's reflexes are also probably some of the best of any human, able to dodge Captain America's shield and take out speedsters. Castle is also an excellent military tactician and strategist, able to create effective plans on the spot, and has repeatedly outwitted shield, hammer, and even the Avengers. He is a reconnaissance and survival expert expert, armorer and gunsmith, and a master martial artist and hand-to-hand -hand combatant, while also being skilled at just about every type of firearm known to man. Frank was lured to the Savage Land where he joined with other heroes to become the Savage Avengers, when hand ninjas exhumed the body of his wife and kids. The ninjas were working for Kulin Gath who was collecting warriors to use their blood in a ritual to raise an ancient god as we have already said. Maybe you should have left Frank out of it though. Number 9, Daredevil. When Matt Murdock guilted himself into giving up Daredevil, Elektra started keeping a watchful eye over him. She starts acting as a vigilante in Hell's Kitchen to prove to Matt that she can fight without causing casualties and prove that she can train him to be the man he was meant to be. Eventually, when Matt gives himself up as Daredevil over to the police, Elektra takes over the mantle. Her first run in with Savage Avengers was before this though. Elektra was undercover in the hand when she followed them to the Savage Land. There, they were working 
working with sorcerer Kulin Gath to collect warriors to sacrifice to a primordial god. In their second adventure, Elektra is operating as Daredevil and goes into the past with this new team of Savage Avengers in a conflict with Deathlock. I'm really liking her as Daredevil so far. Her abilities and training as an assassin make her an impressive hero to say the least. Number 8. Black Widow. A former KGB agent, Natasha Alianova Romanova, better known as Natasha Romanov, which is way easier to say, or Black Widow, was trained by the top secret Soviet brainwashing and training program, the Red Room, to become the ultimate super spy. She defected from the Soviet Union to the US to join S.H.I.E.L.D. While in the Red Room, she was bio and psychotechnologically enhanced, giving her an unusually long lifespan and prolonged youthful appearance. In the past, she was given versions of the super soldier serum so she possesses peak level physiology making her as strong, agile, fast and durable as a female human can possibly be without being classified as superhuman. This also extends to her senses and immune system which are similarly heightened to peak human levels. Black Widow is one of the top espionage operatives in the world, being one of the best information gatherers in the Marvel Universe. She is fluent in many different languages and is an expert computer programmer and hacker. She's an accomplished battle strategist and field commander and has been the leader of the Avengers and even S.H.I.E.L.D. on one occasion. So her addition to the Savage Avengers team should never be rejected. Number 7. Conan Conan the Barbarian was born on a carnage strewn battlefield in the hills of the westernmost region of Chimeria. Members of his tribe encircled Fiala, his mother, to protect her while she was giving birth to Conan. The fact that he was born on a battlefield was considered amongst the Chimerians, and by me, to be an omen that Conan would grow up to be a great warrior one day. And we weren't wrong. He was one of the most accomplished swordsmen of the Hyborian Age and is often listed alongside King Arthur, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Zoro as one of the greatest fictional sword fighters in history, which is a really cool thing to put on a resume. Conan has unusual strength, agility, and speed for just a human guy. He has lifted immense objects or enemies, even breaking the neck of a raging bull when he was still relatively young. Conan usually relies upon his lightning fast reflexes in combat situations, and they very rarely have failed. Him. Through years of dealing with sorcerers, magicians, and witches, he has even developed a moderate level of resistance to magic and mind control spells, which definitely comes in handy in the first volume of Savage Avengers. While primarily known as a wandering sellsword, Conan progressively became a master tactician leading entire armies into battle and eventually Conan even became king of Aquilonia. Number 6. Black Knight. Born and raised in Gloucester, Massachusetts, Dane Whitman attended university, eventually obtaining a master's degree in physics. And that's not his superpower. The descendant of a long line of heroes who took up the mantle of the mysterious Black Knight, Whitman assumed the role after his uncle Nathan Garrett, who had taken up the name as a villain, perished in a battle with Iron Man. Dane became a hero, wielding the Power Lance. He has also wielded several swords, including the Ebony Blade, a powerful but cursed weapon forged from a meteorite which is capable of cutting through almost any substance, and he's even wielded Excalibur. While holding the Ebony Blade though, Black Knight is unable to be killed, even if he like loses his head or something like that. Whitman also possesses the Sword of Light and Shield of Night, bestowed upon him by the Lady of the Lake. Dane Whitman has been a member of the Avengers and leader of Ultra Force, and is now the current king of Weird World, but that hasn't stopped him from his savage avenging. Number 5. Devil Dinosaur. Okay, look, he ain't on the team at all really, but he did kind of help them unintentionally. And I also really want to talk about this dino since I haven't before, so... Devil Dinosaur! He's basically just a big, red, intelligent T-Rex from another universe. Not intelligent enough to talk or anything, but he understands the situations he's in, can understand human language, and even has some telepathic connection with certain characters. As for the Savage Avengers, in Volume 2, Issue 2, the Savage heroes have been sent back in time to the Hyborian Era, and they end up fighting Devil Dinosaur in a coliseum. That is, until they sort of kind of not really work together to bust out of there. He doesn't have many powers other than super intelligence and strength, but he is a Tyrannosaurus Rex, which I can imagine is very helpful. Number 4. Wolverine. This mutant needs almost no introduction, being one of the most recognizable characters in Marvel's lineup. James Logan Howlett is a long-lived Canadian mutant with the rage of a beast and the soul of a samurai. 
His mysterious past is filled with blood, war, and betrayal, creating one of the greatest characters Marvel has ever made. If you don't already know his powers, Wolverine has an accelerated healing factor, keenly enhanced senses, and bone claws in each hand, which were improved upon when his whole skeleton, including the claws, were coated in adamantium, one of the hardest metals on Earth. This rage-filled samurai mutant Canadian joined up with the Savage Avengers in 2020 to help fight against Cool and Gat, and he's honestly a great Great addition to every team he joins. So let's hear some love for Wolverine. Yeah, woo, okay. Moving on. Number three, the Venom symbiote. I say specifically the symbiote because at this time, Eddie Brock and Venom were having a bit of a rough period and had separated from each other for the time being. At least that's what I've gathered from reading. Either way, alerted to the suffering of another member of his species at the hands of Cool and Gath, the Venom symbiote arrived where the future Savage Avengers were at to help Logan, the Punisher, Elektra, and Doctor Voodoo fight the eldritch god Cool and Gath was trying to summon. Exposure to the god's cosmic radiation caused the Venom symbiote to take on the form of a massive dragon, letting it hold its own against the god in combat. The symbiote would do its best to help in the fight, saving the other members of its species in the process. But he's Venom! We all know how cool he is. I don't really have to explain this to you. Nope. Number two, Dagger. When her boyfriend Rob left for college, Tandy Bowen, a 16 year old girl who grew up in Shaker Heights, Ohio, left home on a bus for New York City. While wandering the streets, a man tried to mug her, but she was rescued by Tyrone Johnson, a fellow runaway teen. She bought Tyrone food and the two grew to care about each other. But when a guy named Simon Marshall rounded up a bunch of the city's teen runaways, offering them food and shelter, Tandy agreed to go, being kind of naive. And Tyrone went with her because he wanted to protect Tandy, which was good because Tyrone was right to be suspicious. The runaway teens were knocked unconscious by Marshall's men and injected with an experimental substance. The two were the only teens who survived and soon developed powers. For Tandy, she can generate a form of living light, which is actually life force that she uses most commonly in the form of psionic light daggers, which travel wherever she wills them and which drain living beings of life force. Her light daggers also have the capacity to cure certain persons of substance addiction which is an interesting side effect. Tandy can also project her light into Cloak's dimension to feed his quote unquote hunger. She's unharmed when traveling through his dimension and can pass this protection to others, which leads me the next spot. Number one, Cloak. Tyrone Johnson is the dark half of the vigilante duo known as Cloak and Dagger. After a substance related experiment awakened his powers, he became a living personification of darkness. Tyrone grew up in South Boston and had a really bad stuttering condition, which inadvertently caused him to be unable to save his friend's life. Tyrone ran away from the home because of the guilt of that and he ended up in New York City's ports, desperate for food and searching for someone to rob. Instead, he found Tandy Bowen, another runaway, and ironically prevented her from being robbed. They eventually were subjected to the experimental substance that caused them to gain their powers. For Cloak, he has the ability to manipulate dark force energy and access the dimension that it comes from, which he uses to do things like creating localized fields of impenetrable darkness, creating mobile solid tendrils of darkness, hiding in shadows, becoming intangible, pulling people into the dark force dimension, trapping them there, and teleporting himself and others by taking an interdimensional shortcut through the dark force dimension. Clearly, very useful.